Well, welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time to be with us today on this webinar. This webinar is being brought to you by the University of California, Irvine, Division of Continuing Education at UC Irvine. Uh, we are really happy today to have a, a, a topic and a panelist that uh, uh, will provide some excellent information related to healthcare analytics, data science, and, and really advanced analytics in this area. This, as you will see, this area is, is tremendously expanding uh, both in the U.S. and throughout the world uh, because of, in many cases, uh, uh, in the U United States, for example, the Affordable Care Act and other legislation, legislation that has, has come into place that has put pressure on all hospitals, small organizations, uh, private physicians' offices, everybody to be more efficient, to be better. And, and one of the ways to do that, one of the best ways to do that, as uh, Dr. Yale will talk about, is, is using analytics and data science and health in, in healthcare. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ken Yale. Uh, Dr. Yale is, uh, is actually a dentist by original health training uh, and uh, a lawyer. Uh, which is an interesting combination, and I'll let them give you a little uh, background on that. Uh, he's had a tremendous amount of experience in this area of, of data science and healthcare and industry, most recently uh, as a CTO at Delta Dental here. Uh, he also has spent a, a long time and taught for us here at the university for quite a while, helped us shape many of our programs, including this one as an advisory board member, and spent countless hours in Washington uh, uh, as, a, as an advocate for these things uh, and a lobbyist for these things uh, to help, and an advisor to help push the, uh, the technology in the right direction and get it adopted so we really can see improvements in healthcare in the future. Ken, it's all the, the, the screen and the, uh, the microphone is yours. Okay, thanks Dave, thank you very much. And thanks everybody for joining us. Um, here we're gonna be talking about the use of analytics and data science in healthcare, both how analytics has been used in the past, as well as future uses, such as predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, and precision medicine. And we're introducing the advanced healthcare analytics program we'll be teaching at the University of California in the uh, continuing education program. And for that, we've assembled healthcare data science industry experts. That's why we're calling it applied advanced analytics. We're gonna count on a lot of the work we've done in the field and some of that you'll see here. I'd also like to emphasize that although a lot of the examples that we're going to show um, are US centric. This is truly an international program and it takes a look at how to apply a lot of these principles internationally. And then finally, what we're talking about isn't just uh, decision uh, support or I should say uh, analytics as they've been used in the past, but truly analytics that are being used in new areas, such as population health, value-based purchasing and digital health. Uh, and for those of you at the CES show or, or here at JP Morgan Healthcare, you know that these are some of the big issues that are uh, really uh, facing the healthcare system that we have to deal with. Um, and so uh, let's dive in uh, without any further delay. So to put healthcare data analysis into perspective, traditional statistical analysis actually began in the 1700s and became more refined and disciplined with the industrial revolution at the beginning of the 20th century. The traditional p-value statistics, which have been used throughout healthcare, really focused on a normal distribution and linear relationships with numeric, numeric variables, excuse me, along a continuous distribution. Um, and this kind of approach made many assumptions about the data rather than letting the data really speak and tell us what was in the data. These are examples of statistical analysis used in, in healthcare. And most of these use data to describe what happened in the past. Now, traditional data analysis has always been important to healthcare for business purposes, such as accounting, reimbursement, actuarial reasons, fiscal projection, record keeping, supply chain, and regulatory compliance. Advanced analytics gives added tools to better understand resource allocation, risk prediction, financial planning, and business process improvement. And as you can see here in the bottom, 
bullets are a number of areas where advanced analytics is really helping out uh, in a variety of ways in various parts of the industry. Healthcare also has some very unique issues and needs. And more advanced analytics are critical to address these needs. For example, with value-based purchasing and accountable care, you're required to understand the quality of care and performance as organizations are increasingly paid more for performing better. Regulatory compliance is another area where advanced analytics are important and fraud, waste, and abuse detection is a huge issue. But so is analysis of patient satisfaction, quality scores, and outcomes. These are monitored and measured by government agencies such as Medicare and can translate into billions of dollars for Medicare managed care organizations. In the clinical field, analytics is used for clinical trials, public health, mining electronic medical records, creating evidence-based treatment plans, and managing chronic conditions. And new digital health applications are bringing clinical care outside the hospital and doctor office and into your mobile device. So advanced analytics and data science is now found everywhere in healthcare. As we mentioned, for business, finance, now medical research and development, and clinical diagnosis and treatment. Advanced analytics really were developed in the 1980s and 1990s to analyze highly nonlinear relationships with unknown distributions in complex systems with large data sets. So these are all conditions very common in biological systems such as the human body, but also in healthcare organizations. These kinds of systems don't fit the normal distributions of traditional statistics. So new techniques were created at the time, including multiple, multiple curvilinear regression, logistic regression, neural networks, and similar methods. And a new field emerged called knowledge discovery in data using machine learning and the, these new analytic methods. This evolved eventually into data science, which is really a combination of statistics and computerized machine learning. And this chart gives an overview of advanced analytics capabilities. As you can see, traditional statistics describe what happened in the past. Predictive analytics, on the other hand, identifies problems before they happen and makes predictions. For example, how individuals might respond to a specific drug or, drug or, or procedure. Prescript prescriptive analytics takes this one step further, prescribing specific actions to improve health and reduce costs and optimize both health and care. So the impact of advanced analytics can be seen everywhere in everyday living. Web browsers gather data to predict advertisements that might attract your attention. Department store cashiers record your purchases and send you coupons for related products. And movie rental sites make recommendations on what you might like to view based on your past behavior. Many of these data tools and techniques are being applied to healthcare. And here we're gonna look at three examples in consumer outreach and engagement, population health, and precision medicine. Advanced data analytics and data science in healthcare is growing rapidly. This graph estimates over 15% annual compounded growth in the next seven years, and other organizations have estimated more than that. Amazon, Apple, and Google have taken the lead with new open source tools and novel analytics techniques. And there's huge demand for healthcare data scientists. The, UC, the UCI Healthcare Advanced Analytics and Data Science Certificate is designed to introduce you to this rapidly growing field. So now we'll take a look at some of the examples of data analytics in healthcare. This first example has to do with connecting with consumers. Now healthcare has never been really good at communicating with consumers but for a variety of reasons. Patient instructions or outreach and engagement of persons with chronic conditions has been very difficult. In this study, it shows that using simple data filters on claims data, you can identify 30% of a population with some kind of chronic condition that needs to be looked at. Conditions like high blood pressure or uncontrolled blood sugar or heart disease. And when you try and contact people, only half can be found. 
or 15% of the original population. And of those, only 40% take any action to improve their health. So now we're down to 7% of the original population. And only half of those, or 3% of the population, actually show improvement. These customer engagement rates are a big problem, especially, especially if you're at risk for the cost of care, whether you're a health insurance company or an employer or even an uninsured person. If people don't get health care when they need it, the cost increases, especially for persons with chronic or serious conditions. Consumer engagement has always been important for retail sales, and now retail sales techniques are being applied to healthcare. To solve for this problem, population segmentation can be used. Now this is a retail marketing technique used to figure out individuals' needs and desires. In this case, we combined health insurance and hospital data, but also exogenous data, that is data from outside the healthcare system. It includes consumer behavior and lifestyle information to understand how people act and interact in the real world. We then prepared the data, and then we segmented the population using a technique called k-means clustering. Then we used another me method called classification and regression trees to find the characteristics of each segment. Essentially, we figured out how people like to be contacted and their interests and needs. And then using A-B testing, we, we saw if the newly identified segments responded differently. And the result was a doubling in the number of persons engaged in programs with improved outcomes. They got better care, improved quality, at reduced cost. Here's another problem, and this can also be addressed by advanced analytics and data science, predicting who's going to be healthy or sick. Now, health insurance has used financial models focusing on claims and costs. These models were created in the early 90s. A study here in 2007 by the Society of Actuaries showed problems using only costs when you're trying to predict. The R squared, which is also called the coefficient of determination, measures how well the tool can predict future costs. In this study, it showed that the best performer was only able to predict future costs 27% of the time. This cost-based analysis is basic output. How sick is the population? Who are the sickest? But even if this predicts, predicts high future costs, it doesn't reflect clinical reality. Advanced analytics can add clinical variables, improving predictions. Here, by adding clinical and real-world data, the R-squared predictability increased to more than 40%. Another problem is medical practice is getting more and more difficult as the amount of clinical knowledge is increasing exponentially. As a result, medical error errors and mistakes are on the rise. One study showed that when you go to the doctor, you get the right diagnosis and treatment only about half the time. Now this, I think, is the next frontier for data science and where we're gonna see some dramatic discoveries in the next three years. So data science can be used to take all the accumulated data, even genetic data, and treat or prevent disease for individual persons. This slide illustrates a metabolic syndrome pilot that we did and metabolic syndrome is a very important condition to look at because one-third of adults in the United States have metabolic syndrome, and around the world, the number is growing increasingly. Metabolic syndrome is a syndrome of conditions which increases the risk for cardiac disease, stroke, and diabetes. If you can predict who has metabolic syndrome, you can intervene and prevent disease. In this pilot, we use the collection or ensemble of various data science modeling techniques to better predict who might get metabolic syndrome. This was done not only for the entire population, but for individuals as well. In this pilot, we were able to predict with greater than 80% accuracy using data science if a person was going to get metabolic syndrome in the next 12 months. Once these people were identified, a voluntary genetic testing and wellness program was offered designed for their individual genotype and phenotype, and the results were significant. Half the enrolled persons remained engaged for the entire 12 months. 76% of the persons 
lost more than 10 pounds of their weight, and 70% were on track to lose 7% of their initial body weight. The average reduction in healthcare costs was $122 per person per month, and for the 9,000 people we identified, that comes to about $10 million per year in savings in healthcare costs. So what does the future hold? Well, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, precision medicine. Well, in the next three to five years, new developments using data science promise to disrupt and potentially disintermediate some of the traditional players in the health system. Let's look at some of these future trends and where they might lead. I mentioned artificial intelligence. Well, there's much talk about artificial intelligence, but really limited agreement on what it actually is. So here I'm going to show you a number of ideas or thoughts on what artificial intelligence might be. And it's kind of a, a fun look at what you might think of artificial intelligence as. And you can agree or disagree, but let's, uh, let's put these out there and see what you think. So first of all, is an autonomous robot artificial intelligence? An autonomous robot capable of making judgments for law enforcement and or law and order purposes? Well, the robocop that, that you've seen in the movies. Well, I think we can all agree that that's artificial and hopefully it's intelligent, but um, that's the kind of artificial intelligence people sometimes think about. What about a sentient machine? A computer that can think, learn, and is self-aware, also known as a singularity, like in the movie Transcendence. Well, again, people would say, yeah, that's artificial intelligence, kind of scary, but um, that is some of the popular culture around artificial intelligence. How about a self-driving car? Is that artificial intelligence? Well, I think that's kind of stretching the definition a bit, but um, maybe, maybe not. But what if it can detect your physical condition and then drive you to the hospital if needed? That's certainly artificial and, and perhaps intelligent, you know, some intelligence there. What about a drone? Now, um, this is in my backyard, and yes, my, my daughter wanted to see if her uh, toy high tops was able to fly up in the air. Um, <laughs> certainly artificial. Pardon me? Yeah, I was just laughing. That's funny, Ken. That's great. <laughs> How'd it work? Certainly artificial. Certainly artificial. I wouldn't try this at home, and I'm not sure it's too intelligent, but let's see what happens. What if the drone has sensors that automatically avoid houses and cars and people? and anything considered a safety hazard? And what if the drone could automatically sense airplanes or other hazards and then safely return exactly to the spot, spot where it started? Well, in fact, all of these have elements of artificial intelligence. But again, it's not the complete answer, right? But at the heart of this and where this starts is advanced analytics and data science. That's how we get there. So if you can find this quick, quick question about, you know, a couple of the people on, on the, and, and by the way, just to remind you guys that have, have logged in a little bit later, uh, if you have questions, go down to the bottom. There's a little Q&A thing there. We've got the voice lines on mute because there's a lot of people on the webinar. Uh, but if you want to ask a question, and many, many certainly have, click that Q&A down at the bottom. But a couple of the questions that came up, Ken, were kind of things that we've heard before are, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning sound like a lot of math, and 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 I, I'm not a mathematician or even a scientist. Can I can I do this stuff? Is it is it accessible? Yeah. So, it, a good question. So, um, the field has advanced dramatically just in the last three years. Um, you know, when I started working with UCI back in 2014, um, you know, we use certain tools out there for uh, analytics, and it was either the domain of, um, you know, statisticians or really geeky computer scientists, right? And over the last three years, what's really happened is tools have become more sophisticated. Not only do we have tools that are out there um, basically making data science really accessible, but a lot of open source tools have become very sophisticated, allowing people to do things that uh, in the past were only the domain of very advanced mathematicians. I mean, I got my start in uh, data science doing population statistics um, as a sociology major undergrad, and that 
um, you know, the, the software we use then is now advanced tremendously, but has even been overtaken by other software. So I think what we're entering is a time period where very advanced um, uh, algorithms can be constructed uh, with um, uh, certainly a lot of uh, training, but not as difficult as it used to be. Any other questions, Dave? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, keep keep up with the questions, guys. There's a couple more that I'll ask a little bit later when you when you get a little bit further. But please, guys, post at the bottom there uh, any questions you have again under Q and A. Uh, Ken, the point here is that artificial intelligence is certainly a buzzword, and um, you know it it takes a lot of advanced um, uh, machine learning to be able to get there, but in, the, in between where we are now in artificial intelligence, there's a lot of advanced analytics and data science that can be used for other purposes. Uh, for example, precision medicine. Let's take a look at that. So um, as President Obama stated, the precision medicine initiative can create new medical breakthroughs. So using genomics, now we can predict disease risk and help, even help understand your ancestry, as you know. And as the cost of this technology drops, and it started at $100 million when we first started mapping the human genome, to now less than $1,000 a person, use of genetic, innovate, genetic information and medical breakthroughs will certainly accelerate. And people are, in, are creating these integrated personal omics profiles, which is a comprehensive view of you as an individual person and how to optimize treatment. Again, the foundation of all this is advanced analytics and data science. That powers all of this. So precision medicine and artificial intelligence are certainly out there in the media, but really what the underlying core technology uh, is data science. The other problem with precision medicine, I think, is that um, it has its own drawbacks. When we did that pilot that I mentioned earlier on metabolic syndrome, the results were published, but then a media frenzy ensued. So although precision medicine has been talked about extensively, when you end up doing something really innovative like we did, it raises all sorts of questions about privacy and the use of the information. So whether or not artificial intelligence or precision medicine are the future of healthcare, um, that's debatable. But um, Certainly, advanced analytics and data science uh, will hold the future no matter what direction we take. So the next frontier really is about using data science to bring all the data together at the right place at the right time for the individual. As this illustration shows, we're entering a new phase of rapid digitization of all things involved in healthcare and then pr proliferation of these, uh, as Mary Meeker puts it, native data sets, data sets owned by individuals. And then integration and translation using data science. So this is key. Once you do that, you can then improve personal health management and get measurable outcomes. And this also allows you to compress cycle time with rapid discovery and innovations. So I think this is really the next frontier, using data science to bring all the data together into this new consumer-focused personal health management. And this is already happening, as we can see, many different applications, many of which are here at uh, J.P. Morgan. And every one of you has the opportunity to be on this leading edge using data science. So again, what's, where does, this, what does the future hold? Well, again, using advanced analytics and data science, um, we can improve personal health care, and all of this is happening now. And we're going to give you kind of a, a view of how this is being done in the real world, um, and then we'll take some more questions and then uh, also talk about how we cover some of these topics uh, in our new certificate program. So first, you start with clinical research findings and real-world data. You can capture all the evidence-based guidelines, all the latest medical literature, real-world evidence. You can take all the qualitative information and make it quantitative, creating a comprehensive and current knowledge repository. This is all encoded in a data set. 
Next, you can do the same thing with the individual patient. You collect all their data, medical claims, health risk assessment, electronic medical records, wearable or mobile devices, and even personal preferences. You can encode that too into a data set. Then you take other data that's becoming increasingly important. Here at J.P. Morgan, a lot of people are talking about social determinants of health. Well, the environmental and social determinants of health are incredibly important to understand the context of the individual. We mentioned earlier exogenous data about consumer behavior and lifestyle that can basically be gotten from your credit cards, and then data about your, their work, family, and even risk-taking propensity. We then quantify all that data. We bring that data together. And then with the latest medical knowledge and individual data, we can do some amazing things. We can precisely measure using data science compatibility between the treatments and the patient profile. And then each treatment recommendation can be viewed by its impact on the adherence to a care plan with additional personal preference dimensions seen here. Each patient is described by their personal responsiveness to a treatment plan, allowing us to see the difference between treatment and personal preference, and then seeing how personal preference changes the way people actually adhere to their medications or their treatment. Then you identify, identify clusters of patients with similar characteristics, applying learnings from one person to the next, and balance side effects with personalization. All this is contained in the algorithms that we build in data science that matches treatment options to the individual. Then we translate the computer output for the patient using professional judgment between the physician and the patient. So the physician actually tailors the final recommendation to the current patient needs and preferences. And the algorithm takes feedback, learns and improves, and then tailoring treatment options to the specific needs and interests of the patient um, resulting in improved outcomes. So to summarize, we're seeing rapid digitization of all things related to healthcare. And as we mentioned, proliferation of these native data sets owned by the individual, then integration and translation with data science, allowing personalized healthcare management with measurable outcomes. And all of this is driven by advanced analytics and data science. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. And uh, oh, and let me also mention that um, the books that you see here were all uh, written by the um, co-instructors for the certificate program, um, and uh, they can they certainly are good resources for folks who are interested in this field. Excellent, Ken. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful summary. Uh, and you can and please look at these these books. Some of them, especially up in the one in the upper right hand corner, Eric Siegel's book. Uh, it's a real easy read. There's no math. And I know we've had several questions uh, again on, oh, man, you, you put up a matrices there. I don't, uh, you know, it's been a long time. I've never, or maybe I've never even used or seen a matrix. Uh, and one of the questions, again, Ken, was what kind of range of, of people and people's backgrounds? Because uh, we have, it sounds like we have people uh, in the healthcare field. People are not in the healthcare field. People are you know, computer scientists, other people are just involved in the process of caring for and possibly even collecting some data uh, on, the, on the patients. What kind of people can, can these, this kind of information and, and some of the courses uh, uh, be valuable to? I mean, is it, do you have to be a mathematician to, to uh, take any of this stuff? Good question. So I, I think for our course, our certificate program, you know, focusing on, again, applied advanced analytics and data science, we're looking at this as an introductory course to really give people a good feel for this, um, this field. Um, and um, it's targeted to just about anybody who's in the work day world or even students who are, who are thinking about healthcare. They're just show them how far um, healthcare is going. Um, so you don't have to be um, uh, a mathematician. Uh, some of the courses are, are a little heavier in math uh, than others, but the first couple of courses really are a good introduction and, and give you a solid grounding on where the field is and allow you to figure out if you want to go further, if you want to get into the heavier math courses, 
uh, and learn some of the, uh, the data science. So um, what we've seen is a wide range of people who take these courses. Uh, some people who haven't any healthcare background at all, but have some data interest and really want to learn more about the, uh, the field. And one of the things that we'll say, we, we run some, very, some other similar programs here for a long time. We, we have a, a program, I know Gary's online, we have a program in predictive analytics, specifically predictive analytics, uh, for a, a general uh, set of uh, uh, applications. And, and we get people in there that, that have had no math at all, but uh, they, they get interested. And, and maybe they, have, they, they probably had some math in high school, obviously, but uh, they get interested. And it's amazing when somebody gets some motivation, uh, what they could do. Now, in, probably in very few of these courses would we require or would anybody need to go back through three or four years of calculus or something. But we, we have just found so often that uh, especially adult uh, learners who, who we mostly target, uh, they get motivated on something and then they can dig in and they can they prove to themselves that you know it's not as scary as i thought it was because like ken mentioned uh the, the software packages now do most of the math for you the the important part is the thinking you know what are the variables that might affect this and, and the people that know that the best are the people that are there with the patients and interacting and talking, and, and that could be a nurse or an orderly, I mean, any of those kind of people, uh, if they have the, the, the drive to, to learn more, uh, since they're around this stuff, uh, that's, that's the kind of people that, that can be really successful in these programs. We have one more slide with the, with the Jackie slide, Ken, or, oh yeah, this is, there's Ken down there in the bottom in case you were wondering how good looking he was, because this, this is a, uh, article again we are the University of California Irvine you can come over to our website uh, we are called UCI and this specific area is called the division of continuing education we we offer courses for people that are working working adults to e enhance their career that's one of the things that the University of California here uh, is is called to do we do students, uh, we teach students, obviously, undergraduate and graduate. We teach uh, a lot, obviously, a lot of students are here. We do a tremendous amount of research. We have uh, six hospitals and dental schools and medical schools. But the, the other thing that we are told to do, and we've always uh, been, been uh, uh, required to do, is look out there and see which careers are, are coming up, like Ken had mentioned and see how we can help working adults take a step up to something more than what they're doing right now. And that's what we do. We go out and look around. We find people like Ken and, and uh, Gary and Linda Miner and a lot of people that have written these books that know the industry. But these are not theoretical graduate classes that are gonna get you a PhD. These are practical classes that, uh, that you're going to uh, use to be able to help move forward in your career. And, and that's the only reason we do any of these things. We never offer any courses that don't have tremendously high job demand. I think we have one more slide, Ken. Yep. Okay, so what we did after all that, uh, uh, so Ken gave you some very good information kind of generally, and we'll get back to the questions. There are a few more questions that have come in. Uh, this is our little program. These are short programs here that uh, and, and we call them little certificate programs. And they're a bunch of classes that are online. Uh, there are two units each. Most people take one class at a time uh, and it's online. So you can take it from wherever you are. You can take it at night. You know, you can break it up in and, and, and pieces. Uh, but it is a class. So you, you're going to do work every week. It's just that you have the choice of when you do that work and when you listen to the lectures. Like Ken will be teaching the first course along with a couple of his colleagues and he will uh, teach lectures. Uh, they're shorter little chunks, maybe five, 10 minutes each. Uh, and you'll probably do three or four of those during a week. But you know, you can do one at lunch and another one in the morning or after the kids go to bed or any, depending on your situation, they are very flexible. And the first one you see it there is healthcare analytics. 
Uh, that's a lot what Ken was just talking about, a very good overview of, of some of the issues and opportunities in healthcare analytics. And then uh, data assets and strategy is very useful for those that are already working in an organization, want to see how they can utilize the data to make better decisions, not just from the, the medical point of view, but to, to run the hospital or to even run a smaller physician's group or honestly, even to run other companies, right? This, this kind of thinking about the assets you have in your data and the strategy you plan to use those assets to improve the efficiency of your organization is, is absolutely key. The next one there is, is acquisition. Where, where are you getting this data? And what other data might you need that you're not getting right now? And how can you acquire it? And, and what do you do with it, right? So there's just, again, these are all two unit classes. Uh, we are on the quarter system, it's 10 weeks. Uh, the last couple of classes, the uh, fourth one there is data mining, digging into the data and seeing if you can find some cool trends that could really help you. Uh, the second to the last one is visualizing it, looking at it and seeing the data because that often helps you find trends and understand the business in a way that you didn't understand it before. And then things like decision analysis. How are you going to, what decisions are you going to make and how can those decisions line up with improving the operation of your organization? You know, both again, medically and from a business point of view. And then the last one Ken touched on is, is precision medicine, uh, which is focused primarily on things, of course, that relate to how we can improve the, uh, the efficiency and outcomes in, in medicine itself. Now, the other question that already came up is, do I have to sign up for all six of those classes at the same time? And, and no, you, you, you take a class, see if you like it, you take another one, you could, you could wait a quarter, you can do whatever you want. You know, we, we always suggest if people are interested in anything like this, take at least one class. Uh, we recommend the healthcare analytics class. And the next one is starting actually next week. So uh, if you are interested, come to UCI under Division of Continuing Education. If you just type in UCI and then D as in David, C-E, D-C-E, Division of Continuing Education, you'll get to our website and you can search on life sciences and healthcare and you will see the certificate program uh, if you were uh, interested in signing up. Uh, plus you'll see phone numbers if you want more information about well, you know, I really don't know if I have the background or I just got out of the service or I don't have a job right now. Believe me, we do this for a living. We sit and talk to people and counsel them uh, all day long. Uh, and, and a lot of it's, it, it's a very wonderful thing. It helps. Uh, we we are, are good at helping people, but it, it makes us feel good because we have stories of people that are, you know, out of a job and they just don't know what to do. And they come back and take a couple classes, they get excited about something, they dig in a little bit deeper, and then two or three years later, we get calls from them that, you know, they're, they're in a nice career now and things have settled down, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons we're here. All right, we'll keep the other questions coming in. The, the questions, Ken, uh, uh, was about jobs, you know, so g give us some ideas of the kind of job titles that and then really the range of, of job titles that people in this profession might have, I mean, from the low end to the high end. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the one that we hear a lot about is data scientist. Um, and data scientist, um, if you go out and, and Google that, it means a lot of different things. Um, you know, there are, are data scientists um, who I've worked with who are essentially experts in one particular application, whether it's Tableau, um, or, you know, StatSoft or some of the, um, the other uh, applications that are out there. Then there's data scientists who are purely statisticians and mathematically oriented. And if you look at the, uh, the, the um, ads out there for positions, you really have to, to read it very carefully because some require a lot of um, applied mathematics and others don't. Uh, and so there's a wide range of um, positions that are open. But the fact is um, there's a huge demand because the supply is very limited for folks who really understand data science. And so um, as the uh, field or as the data science increases in demand, 
Um, we're also finding folks who are not so much data scientists, but um, informaticists who are being increasingly brought into data science projects because they understand how to wrangle the data, how to identify the data, um, and either and, and other developers, developers who develop the front end of uh, your website um, who don't necessarily have a lot of data science background, but are brought into data science projects. So again, this, these courses are designed for a wide range of people who will be involved, uh, not only today, but in the future, uh, in uh, being able to um, take data and uh, translate it uh, for patient care. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. Okay, a couple other questions. Uh, comment on what software uh, a person should learn if they were brand new. There are dozens of data science software. You mentioned a couple of them already, uh, both yeah. paid and open source. Uh, do the best you can on that. Well, obviously, guys, we use uh, various software packages. Uh, we, we try to keep keep it to those that we think are the, are the most efficient uh, without having to spend a lot of money. But Ken, you, you take a shot at that. Uh, NIME and some of the other ones, what are you thinking? Yeah, so, so for, for population statistics, I mean, I use something called the Statistical Package for Social Sciences, which is now SPSS, which turns out uh, with their Clementine Data Science module is IBM's uh, statistical package. Um, then there's um, uh, packages like Statsoft has a really good package. NIME uh, is open source. Uh, SAS uh, is, is something that's been around for a long time and a lot of large organizations still use. Uh, I mean, what I'm doing in, in, with a lot of data scientists is now working with Python. Um, R is really statistically, statistically heavy, and I think it's a little more difficult um, for folks who, who aren't programmers to learn. Um, and then you have, you know, uh, other open source applications like TensorFlow, TensorFlow and um, other um, applications that are really uh, coming to the forefront as the open source movement uh, grows. So, um, I mean, really take your pick. I think um, uh, Gary Miner, as you mentioned earlier, uh, is going to be using a number of different packages um, and has used different packages in his career. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't really point to one or the other. Uh, a lot of it depends on the organization you're in because different organizations have different uh, uh, kinds of uses and needs. But one of the things I might recommend is, is, is go, you know, YouTube's a wonderful place. Uh, go on YouTube and, and search a couple of those programs. Uh, the, uh, Statsoft was one of them. S-A-A-S -A -A was another one. And NIME, which is K-N-I-M-E. And then the other one, it's, it's S-T-S-S now, Ken? S-P-S, S-P-S-S, Statistical Package for Social Sciences. S-P-S-S, Paul S-S, S-P-S-S, and that's from IBM. And just, you know, look up a little demo. You can see what they look like. Uh, and they're a lot less scary than they, than they used to be, right? They, they are, most of them are, are process oriented. What, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're grabbing icons and linking them together. Uh, the icons might represent uh, the, the original data. Then you do something with the data with some sort of process icon. And then you've got a line out of that process icon to to data that's been processed, and then you do some machine learning. So, so it's really much more graphic oriented uh, than it ever was before. And, and you know, you're not writing a bunch of uh, heavy statistical equations uh, at all. So just take a look at a few of those and get a sense of, of what they are like. And that'll, uh, I think, help you help you a lot, uh, uh, especially the, the uh, four that, uh, that Ken mentioned. Okay, other questions keep coming in here, guys. I got a, a few more. Uh, is the program geared more for clinical studies or business applications? And I know we have certainly mentioned both. It, it is, and I'll let Ken answer too, but it is, this particular one's a little bit more for healthcare uh, clinical and healthcare business. So everything in this program is is focused on on healthcare stuff. Ken, you want to talk a little bit more about you know the 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 BI and the operational stuff? I mean, you, you did that, right? That's what you did at, at uh, Delta Dental. Yeah, I've I've uh, done both clinical and the business side, and I think one of our um, co-instructors, Montessor Kadri, 
um, really heavily emphasize the business aspects of it because of the importance of that uh, for the healthcare system. As most folks realize who are in healthcare organizations, um, there's a um, real need for business process improvement um, and for really data analytics to help the business. And so, you know, we emphasize that, but we also have the clinical side as well. Um, again, I think um, the data mining applications for healthcare will will um, really be looking at that. But I mean, as you saw some of the books we saw, saw earlier, um, uh, Gerhard uh, Pilcher at, at uh, Elder Research Group, who's going to be uh, co-instructing that. Data, some data strategy. He has a very um, uh, great background in the whole um, business side of analytics. So it, it's a good combination of both, um, and it really is a good introduction, especially if you want to continue on and get more into the clinical side. Yeah, exactly. And, that's, and we did that on purpose, right? Because we know both are important, and, and our instructors are, are not most of them are not researchers at the universities uh, throughout. They are people that are have lived in either the business or clinical side of, of you know, public uh, organizations. So that's what you're getting, right? This is, you know, this is not a theoretical graduate, but a lot of people take these programs and then decide, okay, I'm going to go on and get a master's degree or something else. So it, it's a it's a nice little stepping stone in a lot of cases. Okay, a couple other questions was uh, the return policy. Uh, so if you take a class uh, and, and decide to drop it after the first, uh, and help me out, Jackie, I think it's the first week, uh, you, you, you get a full refund. So, and, and we're, we're, we're really flexible guys. Don't, don't worry too much about anything. You know, we're there to help you go where you wanna go and uh, we'll work with you on, on almost anything. Typical course price, which was another question, uh, is about $700 per class, uh, and, and there's six of them, so that's just about uh, $4,000, a little over $4,000, and of course there's books and everything. Most people take one class at a time, so they'd spread this out over a little bit more than a year, year and a half, it's possible to condense it and, and do it in a year and a quarter or even just a year, but depending on your situation, we, we would highly recommend you take your time because most of our students are working adults. Uh, take your time, especially for the first class. Just always, we recommend just take a single course the first time you take a course, just to make sure you can fit it in. And by the way, 100% of people that, that have been working and thought their life was too busy uh, that have enrolled in, in courses realize that, you know, I can fit in a few hours a week because it's online, because it's flexible, because I can do it either early in the morning or late at night or on the weekends or at lunch. Uh, I've, I've never had anybody say it's, uh, I wasn't able to fit in uh, the time. And most of them are saying that uh, I'm glad I did this because I could have gone on another year doing the same things I was doing and, and not realize I, I had time to uh, fit in a fit in a class and move forward uh, learning, but also figuring out uh, you know maybe a new path for myself. Now the other really nice thing that somebody else brought up was what about jobs and how do I get those jobs and how do I get connected? Well, one of the things is you take the class. There's 20 or that's 25 other people in the class, and all of those people are going to be in the same situation. Some of them are going to be you're going to get to know them all uh, because you're going to talk, you're going to discuss, and those people are going to be assets to you that you immediately go in and hook up with on LinkedIn. All of the instructors are people that have massive industry content uh, contacts and ha have a tremendous amount of knowledge. So depending on your background, you know, you might just have a little one-on-one -on -one chat with the instructor saying, you know, you know, what should I do? You know, I've got this background, I want to go here. And all of these instructors, uh, and honestly, our, our, our staff here, myself and, and Jackie Badwall, who you'll, you'll see on, on our uh, phone numbers if you go on our website, we are all really quite good at that. So uh, utilize us. And honestly, even if you don't take a class from us, call us, ask us questions. We, that's, that's what we are here to do, and we, uh, we are happy doing that. 
Uh, let me see if there was other. Hey, Dave? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, Dave, let me also give it, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to maybe uh, um, uh, answer the question about, you know, um, where, how we, how, what part of the health system we cover, whether clinical or business. And I just wanted to give a shout out to Scott Burke, who is one of the co-teachers. He's working at TIMCO, which is, is we said stats off, it's actually Statistica, and it's now owned by TIBCO, T-I-B-C-O. So he's there, but before that, uh, he was the chief statistician at Scott and White Health Plan. Um, and before that, he was the chief statistician at Overstock.com. So you know, he brings both business as well as um, healthcare perspective. Montessor Kadri uh, is just is an expert, has ex extensive background both in business and healthcare administration, does a lot of work in population health, healthcare management, technology, and informatics. As I mentioned, Gerhard Pilcher is um, CEO of Elder Research, and I mean, he's actually done, um, you know, automated machine guidance using global positioning sat satellite systems. Now, that's, that's truly rocket science, if you ask me, uh, but he's done a lot of work and, and taught in other places. Shaju Putisseri is the chief data science or chief analytics officer at DentaQuest and has actually developed some of the leading software in the industry. Um, and so, you know, we cover the gamut, and I think you'll find the group uh, really excited to, to to help you guys and, and interact and, and teach you um, in areas that you're interested in. Yeah, and again, that's, that's a, that's a, that the people you, you don't you guys don't understand how, how valuable those people are because you don't know them yet. But when you look them up and you see the books and you see how connected they are, this is an amazing group of people that we've uh, been able to put together here for for the classes. Now, a couple other questions, and then we got to shut it down. But Jackie. Jackie Badwa has, if you go in the chat, if you haven't already got the chat up, go in the chat and Jackie has, has put, put her uh, email there, jbadwa at uci.edu. Uh, she is the main contact here. She is a, a wonderful counselor and, and she understands life and people and stresses and traumas and everything that uh, goes on with all of us. Um, but she's also very good at figuring out, you know, where somebody is and, and, and helping them figure out where they need to go. And she's also the one to ask and, uh, or answer any other questions about enrolling. Again, the class start, starts next week. It's best to enroll a little bit earlier, uh, uh, like later this week at the latest. But it is possible uh, to enroll even during the first week of class. Uh, you don't want to wait too late in the week, although it, you could. You would just be uh, having to uh, kind of cram some work uh, if you registered like a week from Friday. You'd have two or three days to, to do the work for that week. But it's certainly possible. Uh, let me think. One other question that uh, Adorf, uh, brought up, are, are, the, uh, are the credits transferable to a degree? There are some uh, universities that allow direct transfer that for sure they will transfer. Uh, and, but right now, it depends on the play, and this is the classic answer for this question, it depends on where you're transferring to. Usually what they require is you, you show them the outline for the class and the number of units. All of these courses, by the way, this is the University of California, so these are all transcripted courses with units and grades and all that kind of stuff. So you, you, you send the transcript and a couple of these units to uh, uh, wherever you're deciding to go, and uh, and they will decide if they will accept them. Uh, usually, they accept at least a couple. Uh, there are some programs that, like uh, here in California, we have the Keck Graduate Research uh, School at the Claremont Colleges up in Claremont, and uh, they accept some of our classes, uh, but but not a lot because they want you to you know, take and pay for, you know, their, their degrees, their, their things as well. As you think about the, the next level with a master's degree, uh, you know, some of these things transfer. The thing you really got to look at is, is cost because master's degrees at most of these places are, are pretty expensive. So you really need to decide if it's going to, if it's going to help you in your career. Uh, and a lot of us here at the Cal, at the University of California, I've got a lot of pressure from uh, the federal government and the state government because people, uh, our kids get in too much debt and, and we, we want you to really think about, you know, what you're spending. Now, our, our, our program's quite a bit cheaper, so you're not going to go in a lot of debt here, uh, but Jackie can talk to you about things like uh, 
uh, loans and, and other things if you need help there. Okay, guys, we're running out of time here. Uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you. There was a, a large group here on uh, the phone. If you came in late and you missed anything, uh, there, this uh, webinar has been recorded. So uh, this uh, information is available to you if you missed anything. So you'll get a link back to that. Uh, and one last question that came in really quickly. The six courses offered, uh, typically, yes. Uh, the, the question was, will these six courses be offered in cons consecutive quarters at UCI? And yes, uh, the only thing that we might add to that is we might offer more than one uh, every quarter, depending on the demand. And the demand is actually quite high right now, so most likely we'll end up offering more than one class, but it, we, will, we will offer at least one class per quarter. All right, guys, well, thank you very much to all of you for taking time out of what, for a lot of you, I know was your lunchtime, and I know others, it was probably in the middle of the night. We've had people, we have people all over the country on the webinar here today. And Ken, thank you so much. This was excellent, uh, just amazingly well-prepared, great information, short and succinct. Uh, couldn't be better. So thank you for that and for all that you do for us. And with that, just have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks again, Ken. Thank you. Take care.